inform you about the basics of lock picking. So we're going to run through as quickly as we can the basics of combination locks, pin tumbler locks, and a couple high security locks that we brought to show you guys. And if we have time, we'll go over how to get around not having to pick anything. So. Um, since it is only one hour, we are probably going to run over time. Uh, we will be hanging out in the hallway with all of this stuff so that you guys can come out. We have picks if you're interested in, in picking up the sport. <laughs> and so... All right. Cool. Thank you. This is Locks 101. You are here to learn about locks today. My name is Chris Suter, and this is I'm Jimmy Jay Chan. Chan. Uh, I'm also known as Lamangelo, uh, spelled Lemon Jello. Uh, don't ask me how it came about. He's the DEFCON 12 lock picking champion. It means shit. So <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, are you guys enjoying Nauticon today? Yeah. You guys were much more enthusiastic last time. Come on. <laughs> We've done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good I owe that guy a beer. <laughs> yeah, I'm buying you beer later on. All right, our disclaimer for you today is we are teaching you a skill, a trade, a hobby. We are not teaching you how to break into things, to steal things. You are not to use this information for evil means in any way possible because I don't want you to do that. You're going to get arrested, you're going to get thrown in jail, and you're going to have a girlfriend named Bubba. <laughs> Unless you want to get on the roof of this hotel. Yeah, someone <laughs> mentioned something about the roof. I believe we needed a legitimate reason to be on the roof and couldn't be it, so that would be okay with me. <laughs> uh, this is not a lecture. We're intending for this to be a workshop, so we're here to have fun. Ask me with questions if you want, but um, we're just going to run through four different kinds of locks for you today. We're going to be doing pin tumbler locks, combination locks, and two high security Medico, and the multi-lock for you today. Uh, this, we're going to run through this as quickly as possible so we can actually demonstrate for, the, for you and so you guys can come together and maybe start playing with it. We brought a bunch of padlocks and, and door locks here that you would see in common practice. So let's get this, let's get this party started, shall we? First of all, we're going to start with combination locks. Combination locks are, well, you've seen them everywhere. They're on lockers. They're securing most of your private property. Lots of people like to use them because it's easy to remember a three-digit code that's given to you. So how many of you guys know how to crack one of these things? Has anyone heard about how to do this? About five, ten. So there's a handful of you. How many of you know people? nothing about combination locks and how they work? All right, so there's a good number of you who are unwilling to raise yeah, your hand. A lot of you are apathetic. <laughs> So right, if you uh, take off the back of a combination lock, which I could not bring for you today, I apologize. So I got you pictures. What you'll see is a mechanism kind of like this. What happens is you have the shackle go down into the lock and you have a pin that goes into a, a cutout on the lock that keeps it from popping up. These discs right here have a notch rotate in them that when they are rotated into the proper position, this little bump is allowed to recess into that cutout on three different cylinders, which is then allowing this shackle to or this pin to pop back and your sh shackle to open up. Now, if we take this apart further, you'll see exactly a little bit closer how this is possible. Uh, there are various pins around the edges on both sides of the combination lock. This is what corresponds to when you have to twirl the lock around three times. It's to get these pins to catch on all three cylinders. Uh, these notches need to line up perfectly at the exact location right here for it to open up. If you take these off further, what you're going to see is this. There's a spring that keeps tension on the bottom, the bottom disc that's going to keep it from rotating when you go back the other direction to pass zero and then do the second number. That's, that's what the spring is for. These two pieces right here are actually attached to the disc and, and are in charge of rotating each disc. So as you can see from this picture, you're going to notice the uh, pin sticking up in somewhat kind of random fashion. Those are actually there to correspond to the number on the top of the lock. You can, by looking at this, determine the number on the lock. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and do a little demonstration. Um, this is actually a, a master lock uh, a buddy of mine gave to me a long while ago because he had lost the combination long ago and he wanted me to crack it. So if you can open up like a spreadsheet or something. Hang on one sec. It seems like a safe enough solution, right? You have 40 numbers on your lock, right? Three numbers, that's 59,000 some possible combinations. That's pretty safe, I would say. Well, it turns out not. So we need a spreadsheet of some sort. Um, what do you need? I don't know, anything. All right, notepad it is. Notepad works. <laughs> All right, so 
the, the one thing is about this design is that it has a fundamental flaw, and that's that it gives away its combination. And namely, if anyone who's ever used one of these, you've probably noticed that when you pull on the shackle, it gets kind of hard to move the dial in certain places, right? It gets stuck for some reason. Well, the reason is, is that, well, Master Lock realizes that this fundamental flaw in the thing gives away the combination. So they also put in a number of little dummy spots so that it's a little less obvious to you that, hey, my combination is kind of obvious thanks to those little spots. So let me show you. Um, if you pull on the top of a master lock and you twist it, you'll notice that it gets stuck in a number of, uh, in actually 12 spots. Now seven of those spots actually stick between two numbers. So where you see the little notches on the lock itself, you'll see that it gets stuck between them, not actually on the number. However, five of those spots, it gets stuck on the number itself. It gets between, you know, here in this case, 4.5 and 5.5. So you go through the lock and you find the five that stick on the number. And you'll notice something about those five numbers. Four of them all share the same ones digit. For instance, on this lock, 5, 15, 25, and 35 all stick on the number. However, 32 all does the same thing. However, it doesn't share the same ones digit. And there we have the last digit in the combination. So we know that the last digit is 32. And what is this, how is this useful for us? Well, we've just reduced the key space incredibly. Why? Because the way the mechanism works is as it turns out, the first number in the combination has the same mod four as the last number in the combination. Do you guys know, is everyone familiar with what the mod operator is? Okay, good. So we know that the first number has the same mod four. So 32 mod four is zero, right? All right, so. It evenly this, divides by four. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So go ahead and write out what our possible numbers are for the first number in the combination. We have 0, we have 4, we have 8, and you just keep adding 4 to it until we've reached the maximum number of, well, 39, so 12, keep going, 16. I won't bore you with it, dot, 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 right? The second number in the combination has the same mod 4, plus or minus 2. For instance, in this case, because our mod zero was 0, we add 2 to it, so we know that the second number in the combination is mod 2 or it's equal to 2, right? So that, that lowers our key space even further. So we have 32 mod, no, mod 4 equal, or no, x mod 4. I got a monkey typing in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we reduce the key space basically down to a few numbers. 2, 6, ah. 10, keep adding 4. There you go, 14, dot, 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 right? Well, what you do is you just keep trying these combinations. There's a total of 100 combinations. I know that sounds like a lot, but compared to the, what, the 59,000 some possible combinations you could be trying out, well, we've reduced it so significantly. You can do this in your spare time, or you can do it when no one's watching. Not that you should, but, hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so coincidentally, when I tried this lock, what do you think the first combination was that I tried? 0, 2, 32. Guess what the combination on this lock is? <laughs> 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 0, 2, 32. Uh, <laughs> 0, 2, 32. It's the first one. We were amazed. It's never happened. It's always been the last one for me. Crap. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, so that's how your basic combination lock works. And this is why you should probably not fool around with them, just because they're a waste of your time. So we took the key space from 60,000 possible combinations down to under 100 and just by playing Assum with it for a few minutes. And those, that 100 assumes that you have to go through all of them, and usually you'll probably go about half through, and you're fine. Don't waste your money on these folks. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> all right. And that, that's also assuming you don't shim the lock, so I'll get into that later, um, probably. All right. Anyhow, so the next thing we're going to talk about is pin tumbler locks for you. These are the most common locks you're going to see anywhere. These are the simple key locks. You put a key in them, they open. That's all you know, that's all you care about. Originally patented by the Yale Corporation. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so this is a, if you're looking straight on at the, the keyhole of the lock, this is what you'll see. And um, this part right here is kind of covered from you. You'll see the keyhole where you put in the key right here, but you don't see this up here. What we have is a key pin where the key actually touches the pin and it's wedged at the bottom so that the ridges of the key will push it up and it'll fall into place. Above it, we have something called the driver pin, 
What the driver pin is responsible for doing is getting in the way of the tumbler from turning. All right, when you're trying to turn the lock and it won't open, that's because these pins are, line, are crossing the shear line right here and it's not gonna go anywhere. We have a spring up at the top that's responsible for pushing that down so you can't just turn it over and <laughs> open it up. That'd be a little trivial. So they put in a spring with a reasonable amount of tension on it that, uh, that works. Anyone who has ever put a, the wrong key inside of a lock knows uh, one little fundamental flaw and it's the reason why lock picking works in the first place is that when you put that key inside the lock, you'll notice that the tumbler actually turns just a little bit. Not enough to open, obviously, but it just turns a little bit. And the fact that it does that is the reason that this whole concept works out. So let's assume that we have this one pin lock, right? If you wanted to open this, how would you manage to turn this portion? Well, you'd have to push this up so that this little line here matches up right there so that the rest of the mechanism can turn with this sucker still stuck inside of it. However, if you pushed it too far up, this thing would get stuck here and it would jam the lock. This is the reason why the wrong key for the wrong lock will oftentimes not work is because the wrong key pushes it up too high or not high enough. So you have to have that perfect balance of getting it to go up. So how does this apply to lock picking? Okay. Um, in your, your, in your normal lock, you're not going to just have one pin. You could just put a little toothpick, screwdriver, anything in there and just push up on, to, on it until it opens. Normal locks have anywhere between four and six, maybe even more pins in them. Uh, six pins are reasonably complicated and harder to get into. Um, Depending on who makes them. Yes. But, um, but you'll notice that uh, what, what happens with this binding mechanism is that all you have to do is wait until the pin pops up over the top of the shear line and it clicks over and, and then you're done. I mean, it's pretty trivial. It's a matter of rotational physics. Well, then the lock companies decided to come up with a little technique called driver pin, or uh, mushroom pins, spool pins, and serrated driver pins. The idea is that if you're not entirely accurate about pushing the entire pin up, these pins get caught a lot easier than a cylindrical pin. So you have this variety, you have the spool pin variety, you have the serrated variety, serrated probably being the hardest one. Um, mushroom is something used by a company named Medico. Uh, I don't know if they, all of them use it, but uh, we'll show that to you later. Um, but this is actually one way that you can get stopped in lock picking, especially with a harder lock. This is why you also want to buy a good lock, is because cheaper companies won't use little bits of technology like this. They'll go ahead and put whatever the hell they can inside the lock, and you, the consumer, go and see, hey, look, there's a $10 lock versus the $40 lock. I'm going to buy the $10 lock because <laughs> who knows about lock picking other than anyone who's s sitting in this room now. <laughs> so go ahead and uh, go forward on this sucker. Never mind, I got it. Okay. In my hand, I hold a nice armored master lock in this hand, and over in this hand, an Ace Hardware lock. Which one of you, by a show of hands, thinks that the armored lock in this hand is much more secure than this one? Not a trick question. Just be honest. Well, come on, it's armored. Right. Who takes the master lock? About 10 people. All right. 10 and people take the master lock? And who buy uh, who the takes cheap the little Ace hardware. hardware lock right here? All right. So far fewer of you. Well, uh, actually. Uh, the people that picked the Ace Hardware lock, I was lying, it was a true question, yeah, that is the better lock. <laughs> cheaper than this, and cheaper and better. takes us about, takes him nothing, takes me about 10 minutes to get into this yeah. thing. Don't be fooled by nothing to get into this. The master lock uses, and actually just about every master lock you'll encounter uh, uses the regular cylindrical drive pin. Um, that Ace Hardware lock there actually uses a spool pin, which makes it significantly harder, though. I mean, once you get used to it, it's no big deal. But for the average person learning lock picking, you don't want to start learning on something like that, because you'll just start getting confused about why things aren't working right. So, you don't have a key for your lock. Now what? <laughs> Fortunately, God came up with these ideas. Your lock. These are lock picks. They uh, have two components to them, and uh, one is called the, the tension wrench because we rely on the process of binding that we explained earlier in order to pick up the, pin, the driver pin, have it bind up against the shear line until we get all four, six, five pins picked properly so that the cylinder can rotate. They come in different, uh, different thicknesses, different shapes, different sizes. There's some that'll just have a weight on them so that you don't have to do anything. There's some that are spring-loaded. There's all sorts of different kinds of tension wrenches that will allow you to put different tensions on your, on your cylinder. 
But this to be absolutely mo- honest, the only ones that you'll ever really use are that one, the finger, uh, and the half diamond. But to be honest, I've started to shy away with from it in favor of this guy. Some people like the snake rake. It's, I don't know. It's kind of amateurish. It's kind of I don't know. Some people get really good with it. Uh, pick what works for you, really. The first technique you're going to learn as a beginner locksmith is to rake the pins. Normally, you will st- I started out on doing that with a standard half diamond pick. It's j- it mimics a key. It feels very good. You can feel the, the pins going up and over the little bump on the t- tip of the pick. And what it does is just, just exactly like a key. Some people prefer the snake pick, which is kind of like a squiggly little snake at the end of a pick and the technique is that, that it's just a little bump that goes back and forth over the pins until it bumps all the driver pins into the proper position. Essentially it's a more random technique. You're kind of just uh, shotgunning towards the inside of the lock and, and just hoping that things fall into place with that. It's a very sloppy technique. It works well for beginners. It works on master locks. That's about it. <laughs> so, but considering the number, the kind of locks most people buy in your business. <laughs> what you want to strive for, what you want to strive for is to get a good feel for each pin in, in the cylinder. You'll use a finger pick for each one of those. The finger pick is basically just a hook on the end of a pick. You can get a shallow one. I have a very deep one that will push pins way up into the cylinder if I have to. But this is the best pick to use. Much harder to use because you have to figure out what's going on in the lock. You're not going to get lucky with this one. You have to feel where the pins are, but this is what you should be using at all times. It'll open the lock because you know what you're doing, not because you got lucky. That's right. <laughs> all right. So, let's play with this. All right. So we have many different la- brands of locks down here. We have what we like to affectionately call the ball of crap. <laughs> The Ace Hardware one is on there, just as proof of concept that the um, not all locks are made equal. Um, I think I'll go ahead and just start opening these. So anyhow, we have this challenge for you tonight. I have some prizes upstairs that I'll be bringing down. If you guys can open this ball of locks in under five minutes, you get a prize. All of them. It's not hard. Let's time this guy. All right, and keep in mind if I uh, if I take a while, <laughs> guess who's been drinking? <laughs> He's not done. It's not yet. that impressive. What brand of locks do I recommend? Well, if you got some hardcore cash, right here is the best lock you can buy for your money. I will get into this later. However, this is this brand is called Medico. No, the the multi lock is better. <laughs> yeah, if you want to spend four hundred dollars on a lock, be my guest. But I would recommend that. They're they're pretty expensive. They're normally about eighty to eighty to a hundred dollars for the hardware, and then for a key and fee, their locksmiths will charge anywhere between another fifty to seventy dollars on top of that. So you're looking looking for a little bit expensive for a lock for your door. But if you're serious about security, that's what you want. If you're not that serious, we have these Arrow deadbolts. This company does not exist anymore, and these deadbolts are really hard to find. They don't exist anymore because, because of one reason. People go to Home Depot and they buy this. Sledge. Sledge and Quickset are the most popular selling key deadbolts out there. Why? Can anyone tell me why? They're crap. They're cheap. They're shoddily made and they're very easy to open with picks. So people say, whatever, I'm just going to put that on my door, and that's what, what happens. So Arrow makes a very well-machined uh, deadbolt, and it costs a little bit more, but people go, Arrow, quick set, this one's cheaper, it's shiny, that's the same thing, shiny. So they take it and they put it on their door. Arrow does not exist anymore, but I would recommend those, if you can find them. <laughs> we managed to find a couple. I mean, we have a couple sitting up here right now. There's that one we have mounted. We have this one down here. 
Yes, it's in a US lock box, but it's really an arrow. We have this one right here we have taken apart for you. We're going to show you afterwards. But, uh, yeah. Any other questions? I picked that one earlier. It was still stuck, so hey. <laughs> That's why it's crap. Very, very good question. I will get into that later. So uh, just hold on that for a second. Anything else? I'm sorry, which? Four hundred dollars. The multi lock. It's an Israeli made multi lock and uses unbelievably insane kind of things to like just blows my mind. It's impossible to pick these things with standard picks. So um, I'll explain those later in my Time. talk. But it's called multi M. Like two and a half minutes. I don't know. Fantastic. All right. So anyone brief right. that? Uh, really not that impressive. Trust me. Because <laughs> <laughs> right, no, so no, you, you win something. I'll figure out. You what. just guarded your tool shed with half a, a dozen master locks, and it took him five minutes to get in. Good job. Money well spent. <laughs> you wouldn't buy a car at Kmart or Walmart. Why would you buy a lock there? <laughs> Walmart's gonna start selling cars. Oh, uh, I, I swear to God, if that happens, I'm coming for you, man. <laughs> and if anyone knows where the fourth horseman of the apocalypse is, uh, he's at Walmart now. Luckily, he's buying a car, so won't get far. It's a Kia. It comes in a six-pack. <laughs> Come on, guys. They had a buy one, get one free sale. <laughs> Seriously. They did have they're not fooling anyone. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, standard pins, you know, you, you can only go so far with those. You have the machining process that can get the pins well aligned. And basically, the sloppier the lock, the crappier it is. And well, what about better locks? That's where we have Medicos. Ooh. I was explaining this a little bit earlier. What Medico does is it said, Picking the, picking the pins up and down, that, that's just fine, but we're going to rotate them as well. So, uh, you guys can come up here and check this out later, but this is the key to a Medico lock. And if you look at it and compare it to any other key that you see up here, you'll notice that they're not just horizontal cuts into the key. You'll see 30 degrees left and 30 degrees right. And what this does is when the pin falls back down onto the key, it rotates it left or right or center. Now what that's doing is it's taking the pin and there's slices along the side of the cylinder of the pin. So if it's 30 degrees this way, that slice is going to be right down here or in the back. And what that does is it lines up for these metal tabs to insert into those pins. This is called a sidebar technique. What it does is the sidebar sticks out into the housing of the lock and when you try to turn the cylinder, this is pushed in. If this cannot be pushed in, the pins are not aligned in the proper position, the tumbler will not turn, even though the pins are at the shear line and are ready to turn. This is an older design. The patent for this expired in, I believe, 1995. So what Medico did to renew this patent... Is they made it hotter. They made it even hotter. <laughs> so we have two dimensions of picking here. You have to put in a pick. I, I will actually show you afterwards how to make a pick to rotate the pins around. But what they did to renew the patent, they, they said, well, we have up and down and we have rotational involved. Well, let's put in fore and aft into the position. So the key now has a cutout that p tilts the pin backward or forward to get the top of the pin, the top of the, the pick, I'm sorry, the key pin to align with the shear line. If it's facing too far forward, it's sticking above the shear line and it's going to bind. So they said, well, that's not good enough. In my head, the uh, Medico engineers look like the, the bug and family guy that just goes, good. <laughs> <laughs> they added a fourth dimension to picking locks. What happens is the key, the ward of this key down here enters into this groove, this tiny little groove that goes way back into the back of the lock and enters into a pin that cannot really be reached from, the from inside the cylinder itself. You're going to be hard-pressed to get back there. And what it does is it pushes up pins in the back. 
in this tiny little secret chamber that then allows the tumbler to turn yet again. I think this is just, hey, look at us. We can put more things in a lock. <laughs> but no, 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 no. That's, it didn't stop there. Some, uh, some Israeli company That's called right. Multilock comes along. Those fuckers are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> These are the scariest damn things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> If you guys want to take a look at the key, we have one up here, but um, where'd it go? Basically, the best way to describe it. That's not it. Where the hell is that? Well, someone stole it already. It's a side. Oh, wait, you know what? I have it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get another beverage? Someone. <laughs> um, the best way to describe this key is insanity incarnate. Uh, what they've done is, is, as you can see on this diagram, they've not only taken pins and machine them to fantastic tolerances so it makes things so much more difficult just in that but they've added in another aspect that I've just no, I've never seen in another key and it's just phenomenal what they've done is they've hollowed these pins out so that they have these hollow cylinders and what they've done is they've put pins inside of pins so not only do you have the first aspect of lifting the main key pin but you also have the one inside of it now it gets worse <laughs> This they, picture they is not that's easy. this way just picks. because, you know, it's convenient to show it this way. If you look at the log itself, the keyway is sideways, intentionally. The reason being is because, well, let's look at a regular lock. You see, the pins in this lock are up here. So you have the greatest amount of movement up and down. Having them mounted sideways, <laughs> you literally have like a millimeter worth of workspace. <laughs> now, this is all bad. I mean, I'm uh, sorry, badass. <laughs> but it gets worse. They've come out with another one. And Chris, go ahead. <laughs> the, all right, so the, the solution to this clearly is, well, you get craters and you get small little tiny picks that can do the inside of the crater. And it, it is not unpickable. You can pick these. It's going to take you the rest of your natural life. But anytime there's a legitimate way point, of opening something, there's always an illegitimate way of doing yes. it, too. So they went a couple steps further and they put in this thing called an interactive pin. And I told you about the Medico that puts the through, the, through the warded side of the key, they put in that little tiny pin that you can't really get to easily. Well, they, they said that's not good enough. You can get to it. If the key can get to it, you can get to it. They put in magnets in this key. They put in magnets in this key that push and pull the pins outside of the lock in different directions and then allow the tumbler to turn again. You <laughs> physically cannot get to those pins. You're going to have to uh, hack them magnetically. Now, this magnet thing is not a new feature, but the fact that it's been integrated all into one key... Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down. Calm down. Go. Cold shower. Cold you shower. folks Go. got a towel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Is there anything else? That's the multi-lock. These things are insanely expensive. Imagine trying to be a master locksmith trying to key one of these things. The, la mean, the locksmith who lent this lock to us said, don't lose the lock because I don't have another key and there's no way in hell I'm making another one. <laughs> there's a lot more complexity to it than that up here. I mean, at the shear line, you're going to notice uh, what's called a, uh, like a wafer that sits there. And if one pin isn't picked properly at that instance in time, all of them are not picked properly. This, pin, this wafer, if one pin, the inner pin, is too high, it's going to keep the, the driver pin too high. If the outer pin is too high, same problem. So you're not going to be able to tell which pin you have picked properly. So you might be wondering, you know, you wandered in a room that said basic lock picking. Why are we showing you these craziest locks? Well, the reason being is because, unfortunately, the whole industry is suffering a problem, namely Walmart, Home Depot, all these sort of grocery store-esque stores that are selling these really cheap, dirt-ass, piece-of-crap locks, and people don't know the difference. Tell well, us how you really feel. <laughs> you're never going to find technology like this inside of a regular lock, and I know I don't work for Medico or Multi-Lock, but God, that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> the... Uh, Unfortunately, th these locksmiths who actually know how to support a lock like this, who could key something like this, are dying off because people aren't going to them for their locks. So, you know, when they're, they're not getting their locks changed when they should. And, of course, this crap is just, you know, going, it's just prevalent everywhere. And as more and more people are uh, able to get the tools like lock picks and such, and believe me, they're really easy to get them. We're selling them. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's pe the, the, the issue of cheap locks be, being uh, a security issue is just is getting worse and worse. I mean, you can pick most home locks with you know some paper clips if you're good. And 
<laughs> and it's, it's, it's just ridiculous to just think that, that uh, not supporting these guys is, is going to help at all. Like that, that Home Depot is going to go ahead and start stocking this stuff because they won't because, well, you need trained professionals to do this sort of thing. I, hold it, I would like to take this second to give a mad, mad shout out to Alan Lock and Key and Coventry. Round of applause, please. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. These guys. If you guys, guys need are anything, two repeat. bonded master locksmiths, two of the smartest guys I know. They will know more than I ever will about locks, the and they are the ones that have furnished us with most of this hardware up here today. The However, best way to describe their offices is um, in that second Matrix movie when they run in the key maker. Yeah. You walk in there and there's just, just like blanks that. everywhere, and you know he knows exactly what the fuck he's doing. <laughs> I have a whole stack of business cards here that I'm going to leave up here for you guys to check out later on. However, I really don't see why I'm going to be giving you them. They are closing down this summer because they just can't make any money in the business. No one cares about physical security anymore. So I would like you to at least take the card and know who uh, made this talk pop, uh, possible. Anyhow, that's all we have to say about that. We're going to move on. Yeah. You guys asked me earlier, <laughs> is this legal? <laughs> Holy crap, I can break into things. I can steal things. Well, I have a gun at home, and I don't kill people with it, but it's not illegal to have a gun. All and right. they'll be blurring out my face in the video, so don't worry. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that was the greatest episode of Cops ever. <laughs> I didn't do nothing. I didn't do oh, that was a good day. <laughs> Church has never been so much fun. <laughs> there is a lot of ambiguity out there about the legality of lockpicks, and in fact, there's no answer to it. Except the, common, the most common answer is no. You're not a criminal. It is very, very legal to have these. It really, most cases, comes down to intent. What do you intend on doing with your lockpicks? Let's talk about federal legality for a minute. At the federal level, what you're talking about is simply postal issues. It is illegal for you to mail lockpicks to anyone that is not a lock manufacturer or distributor. Not one of those. A bona fide locksmith. We'll get in that to a minute. Loophole. A bona fide repossessor. <laughs> That's a fun time. <laughs> a motor vehicle manufacturer or dealer. So if it's illegal to ship to any of those guys, how come I have a box full of lockpicks up here? I mean, well, I found out something interesting. Merriam-Webster defines bona fide as made in good faith. <laughs> in other words, don't be a fucking idiot, all right? <laughs> I'm sorry, the, was that English? I'm sorry, <laughs> speaking. What'd you say? What? There you go. I don't know how applicable that really is. <laughs> but hey, thank you for your comment. Made with in earnest intent. I mean, <laughs> my intent is very yeah, earnest. Yeah, if, if you're buying, <laughs> you're buying lockpicks from a guy named Icepick, it's <laughs> 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 turn around. <laughs> All right, so at the federal level, you're pretty much covered. You're a bona fide locksmith. You're a locksmith in training. That's exactly what you guys are. That makes you bona fide. Legality in Ohio, which is all I really care about, because that's where I live. Except the thing is, I found out the legality in Ohio, what's written in Ohio, is applicable to just about all states. Uh, almost all states that I looked at have this same exact clause. A person is guilty of possession of lockpicks, blah, 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 blah. They will be arrested and thrown in jail for the rest of their lives under circumstances evidencing an intent to use them for something bad. If you're caught with lockpick, ah, let's, let's rephrase this. If you're caught doing something bad and you have lockpicks, you're guilty of possession of burglar's tools. Like you mugging be, someone with a gun in your pocket. You didn't necessarily pull it out, but you had it. If you go up, shoot someone in the head, you're going to get murder one, and you're going to get possession of burglar's tools. Uh, you didn't steal anything from them, but they're tools because they were involved in a felony. That's the way it is, and that's what makes it legal in just about all states. Uh-oh, Virginia. Uh-oh! Virginia, and various other states, decided to add this clause. 
The possession of such burglarious tools, implements, or outfits by any person other than a licensed dealer shall be prima. I can't even say this. Prima facie. Is that Stacy? Stacy. Anyone pre law? Okay. That guy. The Latin talk is after this. All right. <laughs> it's, it's evidence of your intent to commit burgul burglary, robbery, or larceny. So just having these on you, they think you're intending to do this, and now it is your responsibility to prove otherwise. Do you guys know how to do that? Lawyer. No. Yeah, lawyer. <laughs> Pull out your checkbook there, buddy. Scout's Who's honor. Scout's honor. honor? No, that's not going to cut it. <laughs> Yes, you have to become a master locksmith. <laughs> There's no other way around it. And you really, it's not easy to prove that you're not intending to do something. So if you're from Virginia, um, yeah, I don't know how willing we are to sell you lockpicks. I mean, we're not going to ask for your ID, but. <laughs> I've thrown out most of the keys no. I have. <laughs> I'm just saying, that's the clause. And actually, that's the clause that most states that are kind of very borderline with this, they put in there. States like New York and Washington, D.C., they say that they're burglar's tools, period. They're completely illegal. Don't even try to carry them in there. They, if you get caught with them, no matter what, it's, it's a misdemeanor. It's not a felony unless you use them to commit a felony. But uh, Pennsylvania and a couple other states use so a clause such as this one to, to indicate you okay, sir. we have some questions. Let's take care of those real quick. You have kicks, and you're training to be a master locksmith in Virginia. Well, the way, it, the, law and no. the way it works is that you have to basically find someone who's already an established locksmith, and then you get registered as a locksmith's apprentice, at which point it's legal for you to carry the picks and train with them. Stephanie, could you give Omal a ticket, please, for answering that properly before we could? I like that. <laughs> Go ahead. Give it to Brian. <laughs> He's sitting next to him. <laughs> Anyhow, when you buy these picks, if you want to purchase picks from me today, check your state laws, because I really don't want you coming up to me going, dude, I got thrown in jail. I'm like, no kidding. I told you about that. <laughs> Fucking idiot. All right, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Sam. Another uh, thing to keep in mind with becoming a certified locksmith is if you go to foleybellsaw.com, their uh, trans uh, correspondence course, which uh, teaches locksmithing. And uh, that mm -hmm. really means so it's a bit like becoming an internet priest. You can marry yeah. someone even though, God, That's you know exactly. you're not certified to do it. I was thinking the same thing. The course also includes they send you tools and like you actually get a cheap-ass key cutting machine, which is uh, handy. All right, Nick Farr, who has a posse. Nick Farr. Okay, so does the... Under the Constitution, full faith and credit clause, do you, does the state of Virginia recognize other states' equivalent licenses to hold them? No. Why no, not? No, they do not. If, <laughs> if, you're a, if you're a licensed locksmith from a state that does, that you, if you're a licensed locksmith in Ohio and you go to Virginia, that is recognized. However, it's legal to carry lockpicks in Ohio, but not in Virginia. That's a different issue. Licenses, things like that, those full faith and credit will cover those. However, I cannot carry a concealed weapon in Virginia, but I can here. It's not, they're not going to reciprocate that. Some states do. Michigan concealed, con concealed carry weapons can reciprocate with Ohio and various other states. There are some legality issues with that, but you cannot carry picks. I mean, radar detectors, same, th same thing. Well, no, no, but I, is, there a, is there an overriding federal statute which says, I mean, the, the reason concealed weapons laws can vary state to state to state and states have to work out reciprocity is because there's an overarching federal jurisdiction over firearms specifically. Mm -hmm. Is there a similar federal jurisdiction over lockpicking tools that you know of? This is the only federal anything I was able to find about lockpicking, locksmithing tools, burglars tools, anything along that line. Ever, it's left up to the states. So it's kind of ambiguous. If the cops want to know you, they will. Honestly, yeah. if you're trying to do something stupid, you're going to get busted. And you deserve to get busted because you're an idiot, like I said. <laughs> All right, so another disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer. I don't intend to be one. I just happened to go through all the codes and, and, and titles and read all the things. And I was like, well, that says I can. That says I can't. 
I'm not going to sit here and say I have a law degree and that is exactly what's going to happen because if you go out and get arrested in Ohio, I don't want you going, hey, Chris said I could do this and he's, he's a computer Some engineer. Some guy in a yellow shirt on stage. <laughs> That's right. Some guy had a yellow shirt at a hacker conference. <laughs> Check your state laws, folks. Please, please. Don't, don't get in trouble over little tiny pieces of metal. It's really not worth what I think the maximum time and holy crap, we got more questions. Go ahead. Well, I got a question. Um, you say you're ready to, uh, of the legislation, have you looked at any of the actual case law? What kind of <laughs> no, not, not, not anything specific. There were no cases of uh, some guy that was like, oh, well, I only had them in the lock. I didn't use them to pick the lock. That's not, no, I, didn't, I did not find anything <laughs> along those lines. Actually, um, the, the funniest thing with this whole thing is um, he actually got stopped at an airport. I was pulled off an airplane for having lock picks on me. Yeah, this, well, is, this is exactly what happened. I walked through security and they went, beep, what's in your pocket? Oh, crap, I should have put those in my check. So anyhow, they said, what are these? I said, they're locksmithing tools. And they go, oh, tools. You're not allowed to put tools on an airplane. What are you thinking? <laughs> I wonder if you could do that with a gun. Oh, that's just my murder tool. <laughs> You're going to have to check that, which you can do. Um, so, yeah, they basically, I had to take my laptop out of my laptop bag, put this thing in my laptop bag, and put it in checked luggage. So if you fly Came with bags, bags check beat them. to hell. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. You send them X number of dollars. They send you a really awesome uh, plaque that says you're bonded for X number of thousand dollars. But if you're willing to send them some photographs, so enamel them and put them in plastic. Dude, I totally get this email every day. I could be a PhD tomorrow if I wanted to. Does it say super awesome on the degree? Because, dude, <laughs> <laughs> don't get listen to that now. man. <laughs> don't listen to him. Go ahead. What's that? I always lock my car keys in my car. Ah, uh, locking your car keys in your car. You oh. could potentially use lock picks. There are better tools to use for that. Uh, there's the classic tools. Slim Jim. Jim, could you please demonstrate? Yeah. Um, if you have an American car, these, this is generally easier to use on them. But not to say that this doesn't work on most or on some foreign cars as well. But these are called uh, auto jigglers. Basically, they're generic car keys. They're slightly thinner. Um, they're about the same shape as most car keys. And as a matter of fact, these will work on most GM cars. Uh, the way it works is that it's similar to a regular lock picking, only this is both your pick and your torque wrench. The idea is that you stick it in the lock, jiggle it around, hence the name Auto Jiggler, <laughs> and you move it around, and eventually it will pop the lock. And I can't tell you how many times I've gotten people out of, oh, fuck, I locked my car keys in the car. Chan, I know you're drunk, but hey, that's when you're good. <laughs> Speaking of which, beverage, uh, what room is this? Uh, yeah, however, I would like to add on to that. There are lots and lots of things that will not let those work. There are laser oh, yeah. cut keys. There are l all sorts of things that the automotive industry has put in that will get or not get around those. At those point, you have to use some other technique, Slim Jim, whatever. The, the newest be. car I've ever opened with those was a, uh, I think it was a 2003 Volkswagen something. I don't remember what now, but. In the back? Go ahead. Yeah. How does master keying or submaster affect how the lock is? I'll talk to you afterwards. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this. Well, okay. yeah, we'll, we'll talk to you later. But basically, it's the same concept, only instead of having the key pin and the driver pin, you also have a third pin called the, the basically a master Paper. pin. Yeah. Um, and that basically opens up the number of keys that could potentially open the lock. Um, there are varying designs on how that works, but for the most part, it's three pins instead of two. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, bump keys are interesting. Uh, I don't have any here, but the, the the way that they work is it's the same concept as um, you guys have all seen it—the little office toy with the uh, the balls that go back and forth, click clack, click clack. You know, um, what you're doing is you you take a key and you cut it to what's called 999. Basically, 999 is the deepest cut setting inside the key. And what you do is you take the key and you put it just outside of the lock to the point where you can't push or you can push it in a little bit but not too much. And what you do is you hit it with a hammer and at the same time as you hit it with a hammer you turn it. 
The idea is, is that the key hits that key pin and has the same effect as that little toy where the key pin knocks the driver pin up and at that split second where it does that, it knocks all the pins up and you turn it and it op opens. Now, this, the whole thing of key, uh, bump keying can get kind of reckless. You can destroy a lock pretty easily doing that. However, I can't remember who it was that put out the paper now, but there's a kind of thing called minimal movement um, bump keys. And it's the same concept applied, uh, only you shape the key slightly differently so that it's actually a little bit shorter and you apply the same concept, only it's a lot safer and it works a lot better. Uh, if you are familiar with pick guns, they do the same thing. Basically, they just yeah. shock the bottom pins as hard as they can, and it pops the, the driver pins up long enough for you to turn it over. Um, I've seen vibrators open up locks like yeah. that, too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even, we don't mean industrial vibrators. We mean, <laughs> hey, what are you going into that store for? What's that brown bag you got? <laughs> that guy. What, you were behind me in line? <laughs> All right. Again, something that occurred after Myself, church. Myself, you have a question. Oh, wait, no, wait, no, this guy, oh, sorry. Myself will get to you. He's a good dude. Ooh. Go ahead. Some banks, like, they have, like, somebody come up and put, like, one key, and it opens the, uh, you know, part of the lock, and then you come in and you know, open the other half, and right. are those? Well, it's basically just two locks. Um, whether or not they have to be turned at the same time, and that's, you know, you're getting into nuclear shit like that. But um, basically, it's, it's one system just secured with two locks. The idea is that no one person has a means of opening the box. Um, but yeah, that's just how it works. Sometimes, the fuck? Um, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the keys uh, vary in style. Like one might be a, a, a wafer, or not a wafer, um, uh, awarded lock, and the other one will be a standard pin tumbler. But it depends on your bank. Uh, they have some good locks in there, so I mean, you would probably trust their safety deposit boxes for the most part, other than unless someone has a crowbar. So. Well, yeah, and I'm sure I'm sure that's the case. But I mean, I've I've run into at least one that was. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah. But I mean, I have I have I have run into at least one case where. Um, um, a buddy of mine actually had a safe, uh, same sort of uh, keyway, same sort of dual key setup, uh, and I actually managed to break a pick in it. <laughs> well, primarily because yeah. it was so rusted. Apparently it had been sitting outside the back of some business for so long, and I was like, hey, I wonder what the hell they dropped in this thing. So, whatever. Are you aware of anyone using uh, variable stiffness springs, say not, not the same spring on every pin? To you know, I... I, I'm not aware of anyone doing it, but out of curiosity, I did it to myself. <laughs> I, I, if you look, and I don't mean you myself, I mean my myself. Um, <laughs> we can't even this go through a talk without that joke. Right. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> Change your name. No, I'm kidding. God bless it. <laughs> um, this Ace Hardware Lock was something I did that to. Uh, I took out all the pins, I took out all the springs, and I actually cut the springs to varying um, lengths so that they offered varying resistance. And let me tell you, the Bad sucker can be a idea. bitch to open. The, key, the regular key won't actually open this. You have <laughs> unless unless the pins are um, being pulled down by gravity. Otherwise, if you try to put it in there upside down, the thing just won't budge. So yeah, I could see that. But you, well, the reason that a lot of companies don't do stuff like that is because you got to remember that you don't want to make things hard for the legitimate user. You know, you don't want to make a lock so that oh, why won't this open? Oh, I bought a crappy lock. It's not opening. What? You know, the people don't want to have to deal with that stuff, and that's why stuff like um, the shit locks that you get at Home Depot are so like poorly key, and you know the tolerances are just horrible in them. Is because they're a lot easier to open, and people just assume they're working better. Varying the spring tension also is a poor way of pick resist defying your lock. It's it, you basically need a decent pressure, not too much, not too little. If you have too much, then the, the pins don't line up properly. They'll you're going to get them caught binding on the shear line. If you have too little, you run into the problem that we saw with the uh, kryptonite locks that can be opened with a big pen. Have you all seen that? Yep. Yeah, that was yeah, fine. you've all seen that. <laughs> all right. So, well, all right. Uh, are we out of time? Do we still have time? We got about two minutes. We got two minutes. Any questions? Five minutes. Okay. Oh, okay. No. There. Uh, Go Omal. Comment and a question. Go for it. Things being flooded with the market being flooded with shitty locks. With permission, I've had to pick a cash register and expensive Dell server, both of which are miserable enough locks. I can get you open. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Um, how expensive are the crazy magnetic locks? Ooh. You're talking good. big pimp. <laughs> the are you talking the fully magnetic ones or the multi locks? The multi locks. Multi -locks. Oh, the multi locks are. 
fully met well it's basically the multi-lock fully magnetic the whole way through there's a few attacks that can that can challenge those but we're the we'll, we'll get into the that um. the multi-lock is a very expensive lock i mean it's made by a small israeli company and it it will cost upwards of three to four hundred dollars per lock to put that in i it's haven't seen the pricing on the newer ones but i imagine they're huge huh? <laughs> you, um, like I said, the locksmith in Coventry said not to lose that key because he can't make a new one or he doesn't want to, yeah. one or the other. Find um, that wants you to probably manage. would have to do the same thing you do with like laser cut keys from whatever, you know, car companies. You probably have to special order them. Uh, I've never, I, I've, this is the first time I've ever actually gotten to hold one of these, and so I don't really have experience with it. Yeah, yeah, it's right there if you want to. One on the far left. We trust you. <laughs> Rest you fuckers. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> Black shirt. One more, one more question. I've done a little research on it myself, but I came across a, a, a new type of lock, and I can't remember if it's called Cyberlink or Vidlock or something like that. But the basic premise is it's got three connectors, and then you made the other key on top of it, and then it, it passes some sort of an encryption you know, to another chip on the other side, which <laughs> yeah. allows you to snap the open. That sounds really cool. No, no, no. I, I've actually never heard of that, but you know, as cool yeah. as that is, um, you got to remember that with any sort of key system, you it's it's just a layer in a series of security systems. You know, you don't want to invest in a, a five hundred dollar lock and then put in some single pane piece of crap glass in your window. Because as I always tell people, it's a million times easier to throw a brick than pick a lock. <laughs> <laughs> we don't tell that to you here, by the way. What's that? thing most physical security companies don't know anything about logical security. So their idea of encryption is um, at best probably ROT 13. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, <laughs> honestly keys. it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, the new keys that they're actually coming out with are Bluetooth enabled, uh, which allows you to update them from your cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank God. <laughs> oh, you made me laugh. Thanks. Uh, yes, I have actually heard about that lock. I do not know much about it, so I'm not going to go into that here. I have never actually physically seen one, but I saw it. I thought, oh, this looks mm -hmm. cool. Exactly. I mean, yeah. it, well, at that point, you're going to start going into software and then encryption attacks and whatever. It's and again, with uh, as cool as a lot of these locks are, you, like I said, you have to remember it's it's all kinds of security. You know, there's you have diminishing returns as you keep going and spending more and more money. And if if you have a wooden door frame and you're putting a multi lock on it, you're a goddamn idiot. And fucking <laughs> just buy something cheaper and or buy a better door frame. Um, you have to remember that there's always a ways around things, and in fact, lock picking is probably the least convenient of all of them. And 99.5% of all burglars, and I'm not kind of making that up off the top of my head, but it's, it's pretty much the truth that burglars don't like to lock pick because it's time consuming and you're vulnerable, and they'd rather just open a window and crawl through it. Um, for instance, one thing with the with the, 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 the key we're talking about, I mean, as complex as a key can be, you also have to look at certain other aspects of the lock. For instance, these multi-locks, the other reason I like them so much is because they're made so well. They have really good, strong materials in them. I mean, one common way that a lot of burglars break into locks is what they'll do is they'll just take a power drill, and drill a pilot hole into the lock, and then drill a screw into that hole, and then take a pair of pliers and just yank the plug out. And they did that the to me. That's how they stole my Buick. Yeah, with a, <laughs> with a knife and a brick. <laughs> I wish I was exaggerating. We found the knife, the knife and the brick. They jacked it up under the lock housing, popped it out with a brick. Not much yeah, to it's it. A, it's the same concept of uh, how they want to outlaw machine guns, but yet 90% of all the violent uh, felonies all happen with a pistol. Oh, yeah, it's convenience. You know. Why, why the hell are they going to worry that you use something like that? Mm -hmm. We're running out of time. Do we have any more questions? Wow, we have a couple more. All right. Please. Okay, one more. One more. Okay, sweatshirt. Tubular locks? Well, they come in um, two different varieties, seven and eight pin. Uh, you can buy picks from them. They follow the same concept as these. Uh, you pick them pretty much the same way. The only downside of them as, as blocks, if you're trying to secure something with them, is if someone has picked a cylindrical lock, they've pretty much picked it forever because the way that cylinder, and unfortunately I don't have a cylindrical pick here, but the way they work is you basically have little pieces of metal that you slide back and forth and you pick each pin like you would a regular lock and once you've done it, you lock them into place, you kind of 
tighten them onto the pick, and then suddenly you basically have a key to that lock forever. Yeah. I mean, unless Instead you Instead of having the pins it. all in a row, they're in a circle, and people thought, ooh, it's, it's the security through obscurity kind of technique. There's nothing special about tubular locks. They are no more secure than a pin tumbler lock. Again, be wary. Do your research. I mean, that, that whole thing sounded all cool, but remember kryptonite, the pen thing? That was a tubular lock. So, With crappy springs in it. Um, all right. So let's do one more question real quick. Look at, this, look at this guy over here. What'd you have? Uh, would it be wise to carry around instead of uh, lock picking tools? Or, no, that way you don't need to call lock picking tools. Wouldn't it be wise to carry around the uh, most commonly used keys that, uh, that you convert into help lock keys? Those are controlled. Yeah, I that's that those are locksmiths' tools. Yeah, well. they. To a, a police officer, bump locking keys look like normal. Yeah, but you're also talking yeah. about carrying keys for how many varieties of locks you we might encounter? I mean, yeah, hypothetically you could do that, but then you're kind of just restricted to that, and that's no fun. So. You can get around things any, any way you want to. You can put flowers on it and claim that it's, you know, some sort of floral decoration or something. <laughs> uh, my, my, my example at the <laughs> airport, I was considering telling them that it was a mechanical toothbrush. That you have to assemble. One hell of a mechanical <laughs> toothbrush. <laughs> uh, honestly, they probably would have bought it. <laughs> there you go. Dental picks. Uh, if yeah. anyone asks you, you just have really bad dental needs. <laughs> anyhow, All right, anyhow, we are going to be us. hanging out up in the con yeah. suite. We are not going to be out in the, the lobby here because that's going to get crowded, I think. So we're going to be up in the con suite with all of these locks that you are more than welcome to come with your picks and try to crack these. We will explain whatever you want to know about whatever we know. And that's it. Have a great Enjoy time at Nauticon. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. The only picks you're ever really going to need for you most, this one, yeah? most